Holocaust. And today I want to talk about destroying what steals your strength. And our text today is Romans 5, 21 through 23. And you can see it on the screen too. And you can turn with me in your Bibles there. In Romans 3, 21 through 23, it says this, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God hath been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is a word for us from Romans. And what a powerful word that is. In this past week, I read this book by John Bevere called Killing Kryptonite. Now, most of us know the story of Superman, the man who could leap buildings in a single bound, the man who could, who had strength to stop a speeding train, who had the quickness to stop a speeding board before it would hit anybody. We all know the story of Superman. And as Christians, we have a kryptonite also. We have this kryptonite called sin that will try to destroy us, that will try to weaken us, as Superman had this kryptonite that slowed him down, that destroyed his strength as he got weak. We as Christians have this kryptonite called sin. And the problem with sin is that I is in the middle of it. Just think about that. Sin spelled S-I-N. And the problem with sin is that I is always in the middle of it. And if you study that word I in the word sin, in the word true language, that's where we get our English word ego from. Just think about that. Because there's a lot of ego involved when sin is involved. Amen, church? Because Amen. sin is when we put it and make it all about us instead of making it all about who the Lord is and what he is doing in our midst. And when John Wesley was younger, he, he had his mother write to him and correspond with him while he was out doing the ministry. And John Wesley wrote a letter to his mother and asked his mother on advice how to deal with temptation, how to deal with sin. And John Wesley's mother responded to his letter about sin and told him this, that Whatever weakens your reason, whatever increases the authority of your body over your mind, whatever impairs the tenderness of your conscience, whatever takes away your relish for spiritual things, whatever obscures your sense of God, that is sin to you. No matter how innocent it may seem in itself. Just think about what John Wesley's mother said to John Wesley, the one who went out and reached countless people for the cause of Christ. And when I think about sin, I think it's like a bite. I think it's like a snake bite. And it has three different parts. The part you notice, which is the bite from the snake itself, the part that keeps coming back, which is the snake and the part that stays with us, which is the venom that the snake leaves in us. Now, it's not the bite of the serpent or the, that gets us. It's the venom or the poison of the bite from the snake that he leaves in us that really gets us. It's the effect of sin that Satan leaves in us when he bites us with sin. So we need to think about that. You know, it's not just the bite, but it's what sin leaves in us. Because just think about the casualty of sin and what it can do to people. And I don't know if you ever heard the story this past week about a Christian comedian named John Christ. He tours all over the world. And he does so many great things for the Lord. And he has this comedy that is mostly playing. And he has a Chick-fil-A pickup line list that he shares a video in and you know other stuff and he kind of makes fun of the church and pastors 
and Christianity all together, but in a fun, loving way. Well, this past week, there were allegations brought against John Christ from a bunch of different women that accused him of giving him, giving them tickets to shows in exchange for special favors. And also, John Christ was accused of coming to your shows, you know, drunk and, you know, hung over. And it's just a sad, sad state to think about. And there are several, you know, predominant leaders in Christianity that you hear about their great falling away from the faith. So sin isn't immune to any of us at any moment in time, no matter how great our faith might assume to be in Christ. We could just fall at the snap of the finger. Satan is waiting, and he wants nothing better than to destroy and kill us. He wants nothing better to destroy the faith that we have in Christ. And it's not a moon to anyone. It's not a moon to any lay person. It's not a moon to any pastor. It's not a moon to any denominational leader. It's not a moon to any of us. Satan wants to catch us at our weakest moments and just snare us and entrap us with temptation so we can fall into that sin. Now many people credit the beginning of sin to the fall of man in Genesis 3. And this is where I want to get to my first point about the basic nature of sin. They want to put the first in the beginning and the origin of sin of Adam and Eve. Though that's not where sin had its beginning. It's not where sin had its root. Sin began with Satan who was originally created as a good angel named Lucifer. Satan was an angel of light. In Ezekiel 28, 15, it reveals, it says this, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until wickedness was found in you. I want to focus on those last words. Until wickedness was found in you. Until wickedness was found in you. Satan believes the first he sinned in his pride, in his covenant of God's throne. He sinned in his pride, in his covetousness of achieving God's throne. <coughs> and he rebelled against God and he was ejected from heaven with one third of the angels who fell away from God. Now all sin comes from within, as we hear in James chapter 1. Sin was found in Lucifer because of a choice that the angel made to seek something other than what God wanted. He was seeking his own will. <clears throat> he was seeking his own way. And any time we seek our own way, our own will above God's will, that is sin. And all sin comes from within us. In Isaiah chapter 14, 13 through 14, we see the prideful state that Satan, that Lucifer was in. We see the I will statement of Satan. He said, I will sit on God's throne. Satan says, I will sit on God's throne. You know, Satan is a creature who wants nothing <clears throat> but power, wants nothing but prestige, wants nothing but honor. And he will do anything that he can to achieve that power, to achieve that greatness. Satan wanted nothing more to, to take God's place on his throne. And a lot of people, you know, when we hear about lust, too, we think about it in several ways, how we lust after other people. But lust, it stretches so much more than that. We can lust for power. We can be drawn and enticed to want this power and prestige. And this is exactly what Satan was lusting over. He was lusting over receiving this power that God had. He wanted nothing more to sit on God's throne and to be the one who called 
all the shots. We see Satan also said, I will rule over all the angels. Now Satan did get one third of the angels to follow him, but he did not get all of them to follow him. And Satan, one of his greatest tr tricks and strategies is to get others to follow, to come with him. He wants nothing more to entice others to draw them away from God, to draw them away from the gospel. And that's one of the dangers with gossip too. When we gossip about people, we put them down, we, we slander them, and we're acting like Satan as we're trying to entice them away from the gospel. We're trying to entice them away from Christ. We're trying to entice them away from God's kingdom because we want them to join the kingdom that we've made. And I always love the quote from Mercy Me in one of their songs that they said. They said, Why are you you're always trying to build up your kingdom instead of trying to build up mine. And he's talking about how people try to build up their own kingdom. They try to build up their own stuff. They try to build up their own following. They try to build up their own army instead of building up the kingdom of God and the kingdom of light. They are building up the kingdom of darkness because they are enticing followers and people to come follow them in their way. And also another I will statement from Satan is, I will roll in the place of God. That God will be out of the picture and I'll take the throne of God. And a lot of people try to esteem themselves up, but they don't know what God says. He says that I will humble the proud. And that's a very scary thought to think about. That God will humble those who try to esteem themselves up to greatness, they seem themselves up to power. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be humbled by God, because when God humbles you, it's not a pretty picture, is it, people? Not at all. Then another I will statement from Satan is, I will receive all the glory. I will be God. And do you notice a pattern here? I, 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 Satan is so focused on himself that he leaves out the beauty and majesty of his creator. So how much do we say I will? And what do we say after we say that phrase I will? Is it focused on ourselves or is it focused on on other people and sharing the love of Christ. Is it all about you or is it all about God and his kingdom and doing the fruits of righteousness? Now the thing is that God gave mankind the gift of free will, the ability to choose to obey God or disobey him. And now we see, you know, the beauty of the Apostle Paul in the Epistle of Romans in chapter 8, before he comes to this position in Paul's letter, in the preceding chapter, Paul takes a look at his own life and at his own shortcomings and writes words like these that will just blow us away, that will come from him and will take us to a place of true humility. He says, For I do not understand what I am doing because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. For I know that nothing good lives in me in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this dying body? Wow. Even the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest missionaries that ever lived, struggled with the spiritual warfare, this fight about how the flesh fought against the spirit and the spirit fought against the flesh. And Apostle Paul was wrestling and struggling with this nature, with this sin that was within him. And we see a description, 
the sin and how our society has redefined, our society and culture has repackaged what sin is in some of the fallen ways. On the negative side, they might call it a mistake. You know, oh, that was just a mistake. That wasn't really a sin. Or they might say that I just didn't know any better or it was just a result of bad circumstances or it was just a misunderstanding. And sin has been watered down to become socially acceptable in our culture. Even, even for the Christian, sin has become acceptable to them. We avoid the aspect of guilt and evil. And you don't hear it talked about in church that often anymore, and especially not from the pulpit, because you might offend someone. Because they might leave the church. But do we ever think about them never entering into heaven if we don't preach the good news, the Amen. full good news that Amen. you have sinned and you have fallen short of the glory of God and you need to come to Him in true repentance and confession to receive the salvation and the forgiveness that He has for your soul? Now on the positive side of sin, people may say, well, you know, gambling is just for fun. Gambling is just for entertainment. Or I don't really worship my sports cars or or sports in general. All that stuff is just a hobby. It's harmless. Sex outside of marriage, people just call it friends with benefits or romance or even love. In pride and arrogance, people just call confidence, self-esteem, being independent. This respect for authority people like to call courage. Pursuit of pleasures we call living the good life. With adultery we say, well my needs were just not being met. With greed we call pursuing the American dream. With the murder of a helpless and defensive child we call it being pro-choice. With homosexual, homosexuality we call it we call it what? We call it being born this way. But if I'm not misunderstood, Jesus says that we must be born again. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. We have repackaged, we have re redefined sin. We have restructured it so sin looks okay to us. That sin looks all right. That we aren't in any fault. And you know, friends, sin is a slow fade. And sin needs to be addressed in the heart of the Christian. Or pretty soon, the voice of God is just going to be getting quieter, quieter, quieter. Until we don't even hear him speaking Amen. to us. There's different types of sin too. There's the original sin. And the term original sin refers to the term of a defect in the human nature caused by the fallen man, which came with the consequence of the loss of the original righteousness and the distortion of the image of God. We see the first Adam, the Adam, the man, who caused the fall. And we know the story, we know the story in Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 5, and it reads as follows. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? The woman said to the servant, we may eat from the tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, and you will know good and evil. You see, the serpent, Satan, he kind of twists the truth of God. He kind of tries to get us to doubt the goodness of God. He tries to get us to go our own way. You know, because Satan tried to take the throne of God, but he was unsuccessful. So his mission and purpose is to take down as many people with him as he can. 
We see the second Adam is Jesus, who provided the remedy, who provided the cure for sin and fall. And he pleads and he begs of us to receive the full gospel of Jesus Christ. That he came down in the form of man, he laid on that cross, and he was battered and bruised and bloody, and had his hands and his feet pierced with nails. And this is how much he said he loves you. He said, I love you this much that I will sacrifice my own life for you in the redemption of your sin. But the good news is that he didn't stay on that cross, right folks? He didn't stay on the cross. Three days later, he rose from the dead and defeated death and is seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. He provided that remedy. He provided that cure for our sin. But with any medicine we need to apply, we need to know that his blood covers all our sin. He didn't say, for God so loved some of the world. He said, God so loved the world. So he, did, he didn't die for some. He died for all. And he has offered this free gift of salvation. This ministry of forgiveness and reconciliation. And he wants you to come to him. He wants you to receive this free gift of salvation. And I think about you know, the title of this message is to destroy, destroy what steals your strength. And as Christians, we can walk around defeated and feel victorious and feel like we have no victory in our life. And we can feel like we have no joy or happiness or glee or His, His glory not shining from our faces. But God wants us to destroy the sin that is in our heart, the sin that is in our life, because that is what steals the strength of a Christian. And that's why so many walk through their whole life living a powerless life, because we don't apply the medicine of the grace of God. And He wants us to come to Him in true repentance and true confession. And we have to think about what God's attitude is towards sin. God, God knows all sin, so there's no reason to try to hide our sin from God. What does King David say? Where can I go that I can escape your presence? There's nowhere. God is everywhere. We cannot hide from God. We cannot hide our sin from God because He knows everything. He sees everything. He is all-knowing. We cannot hide from God because the longer we try to hide from God, the more the disease of sin spreads rampant throughout our lives. And God grieves over our sin. Our sin makes God sad. And He weeps over our sin. He cries and mourns over our sin. The Spirit groans over our sin. Or sin. We cannot groan the Spirit of God. He wants us to come to Him and lay down our sin and pick up our cross and follow Him. And God hates sin. God doesn't hate us, but He hates sin because of what sin does to us, because of the great love that He lavishes on us. Sin destroys our strength, it destroys who we are in him. But the good news is that God is merciful and gracious. First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and he will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What a good, good father he is, that he will receive us even when we sin against him. And he is the God of second chances. He is the God of third chances. He is the God of fourth chances. He is the God of so many chances. But we need to ask for that forgiveness in this life. We cannot be like the guy in the story of Abraham's bosom. 
who is in the afterlife and, and now he wants to make it right. Now when we die, that's it. There's not another chance. We get all the chances in this life, but there will be no chances in the life to come. Eventually everybody will bow at the foot of the cross. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen. And I love these lyrics from a contemporary Christian band called Cast and Crowns. He says, it's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white are turned to gray. And thoughts in vain, choices are made. A price will be paid when you give yourself away. People never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. You see, sin is deceptive by nature. It's what zaps our strength, our joy, our life. In what area are you struggling with sin today? Is it something external such as smoking, drinking, gambling, or is it something internal such as pride, lust, envy, or jealousy? In Genesis, we are warned, watch out, sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But then the last part just really gets to me. What that verse in Genesis says about sin. And it's the same thing that Paul says. He says that sin, you must master it. We cannot allow sin to master us, but we must master sin and stomp the devil underneath our feet. Amen? Because <laughs> sin will destroy the strength that we have as Christians, the strength that we can use to overcome evil in our day. And God pleads with us. He begs us to come to him in true confession and faith to turn from our sin, to turn from our wicked ways and come to him, to receive the grace that he has for us. And also the apostle Paul says what? That his grace abounds much more so than our sin. Now there's a lot of popular sins out there we could name such as, you know, getting drunk and, and smoking, but Nobody wants to talk about the sins that are kind of like culturally accepted, do they? They don't want to talk about people's addiction to caffeine or people's addiction to food and some other ones we could name. But it's all sin that could really destroy the strength that we have as a Christian and a Christ follower. And it could impede the power supply that we have in Christ Jesus. And he wants us to wake up. He wants us to wake us from our slumber, wake us from our sleep, to know that we can have life and have life abundantly in Christ Jesus, Amen. our Lord. And I want to encourage you to come to this altar as the praise team comes up to sing our last song. And I want to encourage you to just block out that anybody else is here. Just think that it's just you and God. Because we cannot be intimidated or you know, thrown into a spirit of fear because other people are here. And, you know, what are they going to think of me if I come down to the altar? What are they going to say about me? Because our relationship ultimately is between us and our maker. Amen. And one day we're going to be held accountable for all our sin. We're going to be held accountable for what we did and what we didn't do. God loves us so much that he sent his only son to die for us. And he's more than willing to offer you forgiveness for your sin. And I just want to encourage you in that way that the altar is always open to come down and lay down your sin, lay down your burden. Because his yoke is easy. And there's nothing like having God's rest, having God's peace in us. And that's another thing that sin destroys. It destroys the peace 
of God within us. God's grace and God's mercy will destroy you know, the sin of worry, the sin of doubt, the sin of unbelief. So I just urge you, I beg you, come and make it right with God today because tomorrow is never...